treating female hair loss is full of contradictions and today we'll explore a contradiction so stark it almost feels like medical theater female pattern hair loss fphl a progressive thinning of the crown and the frontal scalp is surprisingly quite common globally up to 50 percent of women by the age of 50 years develop fphl female pattern hair loss and this prevalence continues to rise as they age indian patients often present to a doctor in their early 30s and more than 90 percent of these patients show advanced thinning at this first consultation this statistic underlines a significant under-recognized health issue leave these statistics aside because today we're going to talk about pink finasteride how pink is pink finasteride unlike men most women are not candidates for a hair transplant out of 100 hair transplants that i do only about eight are women see my previous videos on this topic female pattern hair loss hair transplant in women after you watch this video in the world of hair loss treatment some medicines come dressed in irony while men often receive the medications in bold doses and straightforward packaging women on the other hand are handed over milder formulations sometimes literally colored pink as if fragility were a pharmacological trait and one such drug minoxidil undergoes this cosmetic transformation halved in strength toned down and marketed softly to women lest it awaken the horror of a stray hair on the chin an act of marketing brilliance that borders on patronization but what if i told you that this same careful hand becomes inexplicably daring when it reaches for another drug a pill whose real power and potential danger lies not in what is visible outside but what it quietly does a gentle topical gets diluted while a potent hormonal modulator gets amplified when prescribed to women no it's not called officially pink finasteride but perhaps it should be because in practice women are given finasteride at five times the male dose and the irony lies in the fact that finasteride here has been given for a condition that may not even be primarily driven by the drug's target dihydrotestosterone DHT. So why do we whisper with minoxidil but shout with finasteride? Why this flip in caution? Why this gamble with terrain so poorly marked? That's the mystery we hear to unpack today. When we treat women with minoxidil, we dilute it, literally dilute it. The 5% solution offered to men is halved to 2% out of concerns for facial hair. The message is clear. Caution is paramount because visible side effects must be avoided at any expense. And yet when it comes to finasteride, we go in the opposite direction. While men receive a modest 1 mg dose for their androgenic alopecia, women, particularly post-menopausal women, are often prescribed 2.5 mg and even 5 mg daily, which is five times the male dose. It's a clinical paradox. The gentler drug is weakened, the more potent one intensified. And in doing so, we often ignore the deeper biological truth that female pattern hair loss is rarely a straightforward DHT driven entity. It's more often a complex interplay of hormones, nutritional deficiencies, aging, thyroid imbalances, and metabolic shift. Not a simple case of turning down the testosterone tap. And clinical studies do reflect this complexity. A randomized trial using one milligram finasteride daily in postmenopausal women showed no improvement compared to a placebo. Higher doses 2.5 mg and 5 mg have shown some promise with modest increases in hair density and subjective improvement in 80% of the participants. But these studies come from controlled small studies and were accompanied by side effects like headache, dizziness, irregular menses and unwanted fine hair growth over the face. And then there is the very real teratogenic risk. Finasteride can cause male fetal genital abnormalities if taken during pregnancy. And with more than half pregnancies the world over being unplanned, prescribing it to women of reproductive age group without stringent contraceptive cover flirts with untold danger. Against this backdrop, safer evidence-based options do exist. Topical minoxidil is FDA approved for women and works across hormonal profiles. Anti-androgens like spironolactone, 
and bicalutamide are better suited for women with hyperandrogenic features. PRP, low level laser therapy and nutritional correction with say iron, vitamin D, biotin can be valuable adjuncts. These uh, approaches are tailored, layered and respectful of the physiological landscape that is unique to women. So to prescribe finasteride freely in this context is to leap before looking. The evidence base for finasteride in women is shaky and the risk profile considerable and the existence of less risky proven alternatives too obvious to overlook. However, there are indications in a select subgroup of women suffering from hair loss where finasteride is best suited and may be considered judiciously, particularly those who are postmenopausal and non-pregnant, thereby eliminating the teratogenic risk associated with the drug. It is most appropriately prescribed in females suffering from pattern hair loss, female pattern hair loss, where clinical or biological evidence suggests an androgen-driven pathogenesis, such as elevated androgen levels, early onset thinning, vertex involvement with miniaturization, or a strong family history of androgenic alopecia. It may also be indicated in normal androgenic women who are refractory to the first line of treatment with, say, topical minoxidil, but provided they are well informed and kept under close supervision. So why are higher doses of finasteride, 2.5 and 5 milligrams a day, required in women? Well, it is to exert peripheral DHT suppression given women's lower baseline androgen levels. Finasteride has also been used off-label in female to male transgender patients undergoing gender reassignment where modulation of scalp hair loss without systemic androgen blockade is desired. But all such use should be grounded in informed consent, vigilant monitoring and an individualized risk-benefit assessment. Clinics where ethics eclipses expediency and patient safety steers every decision, one must ask not only can we, but also should we. Should we prescribe finasteride for female pattern hair loss? When it comes to finasteride in female pattern hair loss, especially those of childbearing age, the answer, unless under exceptional circumstances, is a cautious no. So the next time someone offers a woman a five times dose of finasteride, ask is it science or is it shooting in the dark? When the evidence is thin and the risks thick, prudence, not potency, should guide the prescription pad. Because in medicine, just because we can, doesn't mean we should. And when it comes to women's hair loss, the terrain demands more humility than hubris. So thank you for watching. If you have any questions about female pattern hair loss, treatment for female pattern hair loss, do let me know. Leave a comment in the comment section below and I'll get back to you at the soonest. For those who haven't subscribed yet, I feel personally that I do deserve a subscription for the efforts we make every day to guide your research, to give you unbiased, honest opinions about hair loss, both in men and women. Have a nice day and God bless you.